G'day everyone, and welcome to our lesson on weightlessness. Before we begin this lesson, let's make a really quick distinction between true weightlessness and apparent weightlessness. So true weightlessness means there is truly no force of gravity acting on you. So F, G is equal to zero. And actually a more precise definition for true weightlessness is that the sum of the gravity forces acting on you sums to zero, so you have no weight force. So this could be either out in very deep space where there's practically zero weight force acting on you, although we, of course we know that there's a very, very tiny weight force acting on you towards every bit of matter in the universe, but practically zero weight force, you're not near any large planets or suns. Or true weightlessness could also occur at a point like the Lagrangian point, which is a point that is between, say, the Earth and the Moon, where the gravity force of the Earth is exactly balanced out by the gravity force of the Moon. So those, those are two places where the sum of the gravity forces equals zero. But apparent weightlessness is a bit different. With apparent weightlessness, it's when the normal force acting on you equals zero. So even though you still have a gravity force, there's no force pushing, say, uh, the f off the ground onto your feet. The normal force equals zero. And this occurs in very specific situations, often to do with circular motion. So imagine you're in a plane, and the top of the plane is facing up there. And that plane is coming through a perfect circle of radius, in this case we'll say 500 meters, and it crosses this top point here with a speed to the right, which is unknown. And you're on this plane, standing with your feet on the ground. If you were truly weightless, it would just be that you weren't near any massive bodies, but in this case you are, you're near the Earth. So you do have the Earth's uh, gravity force acting on you. Let's put in a few values here. Radius equals 500, your mass equals 80, and the velocity is a mystery for now, but we know you are weightless at this point. So you have the Earth's weight force acting on you. Since you're close to the Earth's surface, we approximate it as mg, or 80 times 10, 800 newtons. And if you are moving in a circle, then your circular motion force is mv squared on r, which is equal to 80 v squared on 500. So this is the force that has to be acting on you to keep you moving in a circle. And the net forces on you are the weight force here and a normal force. In this case, we know that if you are apparently weightless, the normal force is equal to zero. So the net force on you is equal to simply 800 newtons. Normally it would be 800 newtons take away the normal force, which is acting in the opposite direction. But since normal equals zero, we can leave it out. And that must be equal to the centripetal force acting to keep you moving in that circle. So we have 800 divided by 80 equals 10, which is equal to V squared on 500. 5,000 equals V. V around about equals 70 meters per second. So we found the velocity that this plane has to be traveling to make sure you're weightless. If you weren't weightless. If you were experiencing some normal force, it means the plane is simply going too slow. And this ties in with an experience that some people may have had when driving. If you're driving with someone who's a bit reckless and they're going over a top of a hill and they're going quite fast, for a moment you get that sick feeling in your stomach and you feel like you're almost about to come off the seat. This feeling is made worse if they're moving at a higher speed. So if the velocity goes up, then the normal force is actually reduced further. If you're going too slow, more normal force is required. And if you're going too fast, this normal force actually flips over and points that way. We'll see how that works in a second. So this was an example 
where we assumed someone was apparently weightless, the normal force was equal to zero, and we figured out the correct velocity that would enable them to keep moving in that circle. Now let's figure out for another plane moving around in a circle, m equals admg v equals, we'll change the radius of this circle. Instead of having a radius of 500, we'll say there's a smaller plane moving around at a radius of 100 meters. And the velocity in this case is only 10 meters per second. We cannot say yet that the normal force equals zero because we don't know if this person is actually weightless. So we know V, we know M, and we know R. We can figure out the centripetal force. The centripetal force is equal to m v squared on r. That's 80 times 10 squared on 100. That comes to 80 newtons. Now the net force on this person here, if, we if we've already taken fc to be positive, in this direction here, so the net force is equal to 800 newtons, that's the gravity force, take away the normal force, there. And since we know the object is moving in the circle, the net force should equal the centripetal force. So we have 80 equals 800 take away n. I'll leave out this newton because it's getting a bit confusing with the normal force in there. So here we see, this is the net force on the object, which we know because it's moving in a circle at 10 meters a second and a radius of 100 meters and a mass 80. This is the gravity force and this is the normal force. The gravity force and the normal force, by the rules of circular motion, must sum to 80 newtons. If they did not sum to 80 newtons, this object would not truly be moving in a circle. So. The gravity force is counted as positive. The normal force is counted as negative. 80 equals 100 take away n. n equals 800. Sorry, 80 equals 800 take n. n equals 800 take away 80. n is equal to 720 newtons. So we'll set up our equation again. m v squared on r is equal to m g, take away the normal. This is the fundamental equation for weightlessness when you're talking about circular motion. The centripetal force has to be provided by the weight force, and at the top here when the normal is acting in the opposite direction, it's take away normal. If you move at a higher velocity here, this term becomes bigger, and you expect this side to also grow, and we do that by reducing the term that we're taking away. So the faster you go, the less normal force you experience until this becomes zero as V gets big enough, or alternatively, you can experience weightlessness if N equals zero because R goes down. So that's the way the different variables are related. If we work not with the real values as we did here, but simply with algebra until the final moment. So we'll, here we were trying to find what the normal force was. Let's see if we can get it by itself. The normal force is equal to mg take away mv squared on r. And we can solve right away that's 800 take away 80, 10 squared on 100. Divide everything there by 100, 720. So it pays in apparent weightlessness questions to work purely with algebra until the very end. Now interestingly, we can do the same thing, I'll backpedal for a second, and show that I can use the same strategy if I did not know the velocity here. But I did assume that this person was weightless. I know that mv squared on r is equal to mg take normal. The normal is equal to zero. So mv squared on r is equal to mg. We're trying to find the velocity here. Divide both sides by m. Multiply both sides by r. Take the square root of both sides. v is the square root 
of gr, that's the square root of 10 times Hmm, before, sorry, I've changed the radius down here. Before the radius was 500, so it's 10 times 500, square root of 5,000, again, around about 70. So for the example that, that we did second, when the radius was 100, the velocity that gives weightlessness when n equals 0 is equals the square root of gr equals the square root of... I'll do that slower, 10 times 100, which is equal to 1,000 to the power of 0.5, 31 point six meters per second. So I think before we figured the person was traveling at 10 meters a second, and they did still have a big normal force, they'd have to bump their speed up to 31.6 meters a second in order to experience weightlessness. Now weightlessness questions when combined with roller coasters can get quite tricky because that's, that's when you have to incorporate kinetic energy, circular motion, and uh, yeah, just kinetic energy and circular motion as well as this little picture here with the forces. So check out the example questions on roller coasters and weightlessness to get a better understanding of how to solve these.